Quite a few people on Mr. Elliptic's Discord server seemed like they were really eager for an explanation about the real shader mindset. This is not specifically talking about how to solve a single shader, but rather how to build the solutions for a shader problem. This video was also made for Gogodo Jam 3. It's a super cool month long event and this time we have two jam types that you can join. There's still some time before the jam starts so check out the description for the website and additional details. You can't solve a problem without understanding what tools you have and how they work. Fragment shaders are basically just shaders that run on every pixel of the object. I should mention the people who created shaders have never looked at a dictionary before. Check out my last shader video to see what I mean. And their end goal is to modify the color of the object. For fragment shaders, there are what I call the three cardinal tools. Remember these since they will be important later on. They are animations, interpolation, and masking. Animations. Anything animated in a fragment shader will always involve modifying UV coordinates linked to the time variable. Most animations will usually involve noise textures too. Anything in a fragment shader that you can see varying from place to place such as the color of water as it gets deeper, creating a blend between two colors or applying a mix of wind and player interaction in a grass shader will always involve interpolation. Shader people are cool though, we don't just use some linear interpolations like Neanderthals. We can do cool non-linear interpolations using Smoothstep. The only cool person who uses linear interpolation in shaders is Freya Homer, who uses it for the Castellayer's algorithm in Bezier Curves. And you don't look like no Freya Homer because she doesn't watch my videos. Also, she won't respond to any of my emails. Masking. Anytime you see an effect being selectively applied, perhaps confined to a single area or only being applied when certain other factors are present, a masking method will always be involved. Masking is the act of applying an effect only where the mask defines it which is done within the shader. The mask is just a floating point value between 0 and 1 that you multiply with your effect. Anywhere the mask is 0 will cancel out your effect because multiplying anything by 0 equals 0 and anywhere where the mask is 1 will retain the full effect. Identifying the problem I know this seems like a very obvious step, but I'm not specifically talking about the problem as a whole. Rather, I want you to identify all the little problems that go into the effect that you're trying to make. For example, if you watch a lot of Godot YouTubers, you might be familiar with the channel Play With First of All. I hope I said that right, please don't kill me. Now I have no connection to them, but I saw this water shader that they have in their game and it looked super cool. I have no idea what the real code is behind this shader, but using our shader toolkit we can actually dissect this problem into its individual parts and then remake it ourselves. So let's look at it a bit more closely. I can see that there's this water distortion effect, but it's animated. So that means we must somehow modify the UV coordinates of something with time. What is that something? Well, the water seems to distort whatever is behind it, which in Godot is the screen texture. Now, the distortion isn't a constant value, but rather something that is different for every pixel. But you can see that it's kind of related to every neighboring pixel, which of course means that it's a noise texture. Also, there's these really fancy specular highlights. If we look closely at the motion of these, it's weird. In some cases, it seems to be moving towards the top left, but in other cases, it seems to be moving towards the bottom right. This one's a little less easily obvious, but the answer is that it's both. If we can identify something moving towards the top left, then something is moving towards the top left. If we can observe something moving towards the bottom right, then something is moving towards the bottom right. The key here is that we can clearly see that they're both affecting the exact same thing, the specular highlights. The last thing to notice is that wherever there is a specular highlight, the pixel switches from displaying water to displaying specular stuff which means we selectively apply the water distortion wherever there is no specular highlight. That should sound familiar since it's just masking. Here's my recreation of this effect, although it's a little budget version because I don't have the assets that look as good as First of All's Fungin. Also here's the code, it will be up on GitHub or something in the description if you're interested. I'll add comments to the code so you can see the implementation of each part. Now let's look at another example to solidify this idea but in 3D. Let's look at the grass from Codier's weird shooter game. The grass is really just made out of a bunch of cards which are quads. 
but every vertex of the card moves together. Also, it seems like the wind is applied over a large area in these big blobby chunks, which of course means that it's a noise texture. This is animated, but it's a little different since we're not working with fragment shaders, but a vertex shader instead. So we don't modify the final color of a pixel, instead we modify the final position of a vertex. So here, instead of modifying UV coordinates with the time variable, we modify vertex positions with the time variable, but we still have to use UV coordinates to scroll the noise texture. You can check out my last shader video or click the card in the top right to learn how to do that. Now also notice that the wind effect is only applied to the top vertices. The ones at the bottom do not move but stay planted in the ground. What does that mean though? It means we're selectively applying the noise offset only to the top vertices, so there's a mask involved here. There's two ways to do this, either you set the bottom of the cards to have their UV's Y coordinate to be 0, or you vertex paint the bottom of the cards in black. How do you do that? I don't know, I'm not a blender artist, I just do shaders. Don't worry about these small tricks, you'll learn them as you watch shader tutorials such as mine. And don't tell anybody, but like, my shader tutorials are like, they're, they're sick, there's like nobody better than me, I'm, I'm the best on the platform. I also recommend watching Unity and Unreal Shader tutorials because the concepts are identical and Godot Shader's resources are, well, non-existent if I'm honest. Godot Shaders has some really cool shaders, but it's comparatively tiny to the resources that Unity and Unreal have. And the thing is, shader concepts are identical regardless of the engine. Now, when I say I want a water shader that has these cool refractions and normal maps and all these kinds of stuff, that's an image that you have in your head. And I want you to dissect that image in the same way that we did for these other shaders. When you're making your own shader, you're really just dissecting that final image you have in your head and if that image is not so strong, look at references, like any artist, pull up some references or games or even other people's shaders and build that image. Go Godot Jam 3 is beginning on May 27th. It'll be an awesome opportunity to try out the Godot game engine, to show off a game prototype, or just to have some fun. The Ultra Jam is also going to have a prize pool for the winners. Check it out through the link in the description, and thank you for watching.